All right, play the rest. No, I'm just kidding. Well, good morning. So words really do have power, and believing a lie is what the enemy wants you to do. When the enemy comes to you in your life, a lot of times we think, oh, it's Satan whispering in my ear. The truth is, oftentimes he uses what somebody else said to you or how somebody made you feel in order to set up what the Bible calls a stronghold. And what a stronghold is, is basically a fort in the middle of your life or in the middle of your mind. And so you might have a, a tape that plays over and over where, you know, something happens and you tend to think, oh, they don't care about me or they don't like me. And the enemy, just like this bow, can set up in your life and fire into all the other areas of your life. And that's what a stronghold is. And so what we're going to look at today is a very simple message. It's not real complicated, but you have to make a commitment to do that, to pay attention to how you think and to take captive those thoughts. And, and it reminds me of a story when I was a kid. Um, when I was about 18, um, uh, my dad, by the way, worked construction, so we had all this construction stuff at our disposal. One uh, thing that we had were these huge... Uh, plastic work glasses. You know what I'm talking about? They, now they make these little things, but we have these huge things. And so one night I was at home for July 4th weekend, and uh, my brother and uh, my two brothers and my brother-in-laws, and some, I think there were some other guys there, we put on these goggles, and my brother had just been to South Carolina, so he had bottle rockets. By the way, if you're under 21, this uh, story is not recommended for you. And uh, so... <laughs> So we decided that we would have a bottle rocket fight. We'd never done this before. And we decided in the backyard we'd have a bottle rocket fight. Now, now let me just tell you, though, it was not a fair fight. Because my brother-in-law, Dufus, that's the name I have for him, Dufasa in the Greek, he, uh, he decided that he would get in the middle of our backyard was a tree fort. And my dad, remember, was a contractor so he built us a tree fort that was essentially a small house and so it was about 10 by 10 it had a regular real roof on it it had windows um, uh, but it was large and it had a you know a, a ladder to the bottom and you would go in and then you could close the hatch so my brother-in-law got his stuff and he went to the tree fort we didn't know that and as soon as somebody said go or yelled or they fired a buzzer or, I don't know, it was time to go. All of a sudden, from the tree fort where he could see everyone, my brother-in-law began pegging all of us. One of, if you've never had a bottle rocket or heard a bottle rocket go off, it's one thing going away from you. Something totally different coming towards you. And so you're seeing something, and, and he was pegging us with bottle rockets. And so what I figured out, he was looking at something else, and so what I figured out is, I've got to take that out. I've got to, somehow, he's got this huge fortress, I've got to place a bottle rocket just right so it'll go in the window. I wish you could see what I saw next. So I went over to the side, I could see the window, I was very intentional, I got the bottle rocket ready, and it went in the window, now here's what's awesome. The bottle, it was dark, and the bottle rocket puts out just a little light so I could actually see the shadows on the inside ceiling. So as soon as it went in, I saw this. <laughs> and then I heard, ow, 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 and you could see him running around the fort as the thing just kept bouncing on the inside of the fort. And he was yelling and screaming. He opened the bottom and he fell, like face first. He was okay, don't, don't worry about him. <laughs> I want no compassion or sympathy for him at all, okay? Although this is the brother-in-law that I've caught twice on trouble hooks while fishing, but that's another story. Hey, he's got big ears. It's not my fault. Okay, so, Rod, if you watch this, I'm really sorry. My sister Kelly watches the sermons every week. Uh, it's my other brother-in-law I'm talking about. Anyway, so... So he comes flying out of there. It was awesome. No longer did we get pegged. And I wish you could have seen the shadows. It really was like a bad movie. Ah, 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 you know, just <laughs> trying to run from this bottle rocket attacking him. But in order to take out that stronghold, I had to be very intentional. I had to focus on it. I had to, to figure out what was going on and then take it out. Listen, 
you have an enemy in your life that will put thoughts in your mind. And maybe it's one thought that you've had your whole life, and, and, and we're going to talk about some of those, or, or maybe it's several negative thoughts to keep you from God's best for you. And so this message today, although it's simple, I want to tell you something. This message can absolutely change your life. If you'll pay attention to these things that go through your mind, if you'll help your children to pay attention to what they think, it will change your life. So here's some common negative thoughts. By the way, before I get here, I want to say this as I do these common negative thoughts. We all know someone who is beautiful. And you say, oh, you are beautiful. And they look at you and they say, no, I'm ugly. Does, does everybody know somebody like that? We all know somebody? And they're not saying it to try to get you to say it again. You know what I'm talking about? Like somebody like, oh, no, I'm ugly. Say it again. <laughs> right? I'm talking about somebody real, and you, or you say, you're really talented. And they say, uh, uh, and they kind of, uh, right? But you're like, no, you really are. Like, and there's some people who can sing, they have wonderful voices. And you say, you sing great. And they go, uh, now, we all know American Idol. There's people who think they can sing, right? We all have that friend. But by the way, be a good friend. Before they go on television, like, you don't have to, if they sing in church, you just let them go. And, oh, it just, that was great. But if they're going to get on TV, at that point, you go, listen, I just want you to know, for years we've told you you've had a good voice. But before you get embarrassed on national TV, you're horrible. We just, we want to tell you. Right? But, but I'm talking about these people that are talented, or, or, or they're beautiful, or they, they have a gift, and you say, oh, you're so gifted, and they go, oh. Because at one point, somebody told them something, and they have this message that they play over and over. I asked somebody last night, or somebody came to me last night, they said, I know what message plays in my mind whenever I have something. I said, oh, oh, what is that? Oh, it's, uh, you know good, you know good, you know good, right? Baby, you know good. And that's what the enemy wants you. He wants you to defeat you before you even start. So here's some common thoughts. Number one, I'm never good enough. That has to do with measuring up. We're going to talk about that in a minute. My past defines me. Some of you have had things happen in your past, and you carry that around, and you think, I'll never improve. Number three, I have no purpose. That happens a lot. By the way, a lot of teenagers struggle with that today. With all the technology and everything that we have, they're so busy looking at everyone, they don't know why they're here. Number four, I will be rejected. Some of you walk around, you're just expecting rejection. Anytime something happens, you, you become overly sensitive to people and you expect it. And then number five is the most dangerous. I have to earn God's love. I need to perform. And by the way, there are churches, Christian churches this morning, that are teaching that in order to make God happy, you got to do a bunch of stuff. And it's not about that. You can't earn your way to God. You don't earn your way to salvation. And we'll get there in a minute. So I want to look at this because I looked, I was thinking, who in the Bible was given a lot of rejection messages. Who in the Bible was given over and over, you're no good, you don't matter, it's, you're not important. And I thought of King David. King David is mentioned over and over in Scripture. He's mentioned in prophecy about Jesus, and then he's in Jesus' line, and it was said that, that he was in the line of David. You remember, uh, uh, they had Joseph, they had to go to Bethlehem, which was the city of David. And so David over and over. But let's look at David's childhood. David had seven brothers and he was number eight. You know, everybody says, we're number one. Nobody says, we're number eight. Nobody, nobody, you don't have a chance. I'm sure he got leftover clothes, right? Number one. A message that you and I get. You don't measure up. You don't measure up. Some of you, you spend your whole life comparing yourself to everyone else. And so you get on Facebook, and you look at somebody's grammar, and you say, that person's an idiot. Look how smart I am. <laughs> they did the wrong kind of there there. <laughs> but then, <laughs> but then, but then you show up at church, and, and you see somebody who just, they look awesome, and they seem so smart, and you feel so dumb, and, and you think, I, I can't do that. I'll never forget years ago, I went to a conference for pastors. I was just a brand new youth pastor. There were thousands of pastors there. And pastors are funny when you get around them. I, I, it's, it's interesting. 
But, but a lot of pastors have this voice. Good morning. I can't even do it. It like hurts. <clears throat> Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to First Crazy Church of Fort St. John. And they sing, and they have these incredible baritone voices. Oh, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. Right? And I'm like, hey, how's it going? Good to see you. <laughs> How great thou art. Right? Okay. And I'm, I'm si all these passages, and they're singing, and it's like, oh, and I'm, hey, right, there, right? And then I just all of a sudden, this is what I heard. You will never measure up to these people. And in the middle of singing, I just sat down. I just sat, I sat down. I remember, I sat down. And they're, and they're just singing away. And I'm just sitting there going, I, I can't do this. I, I can't be like this. I mean, these people have focus, and I'm ADD. I'm distracted right now. I'm in the middle. These people, you know, they, they like give a point and actually tell a story, and they don't wander off. I can't do this. And then God spoke to me. To my heart, I said, I don't expect you to be anyone else. Just be you. And that's enough. And today, if you're sitting comparing yourself to others, see, you'll become prideful when you think you're a little, a little better than that other person. <laughs> that's lovely. <laughs> and then you go, but I feel so stupid compared to that person. I don't know. <laughs> They're so much smarter than me, and I'm just this country bumpkin. <laughs> And you go through life either thinking you're awesome and everybody else is idi are idiots. Like when I drive, that's pretty much my, right? I know how to drive and you don't. Let me show you, right? Or you feel inadequate and you feel like a failure. Well, that's how David felt. How do I know? Because the prophet came and he shows up and he says to David's dad, bring all your kids. One of them is going to be a king in the future. So his dad goes and gets the seven brothers and leaves David with the sheep. Listen to what it says. And so, and so the prophet goes through, and every single one, God says, I know he looks tall. I know he looks good. I know he looks great. But that's not the one. And so he goes through all the brothers, and he's like, this is the verse. Listen to this. Then he asked Jesse, I love this, are these all the sons you have? He's got to ask, he's a prophet. This guy can call, has called fire down from heaven. And, he, and he's going, do you have any other sons? Jesse answered, I still have the youngest. By the way, this word youngest here in the Hebrew, it doesn't carry into English. But it means I still have the leftover. I still have the remainder. Yeah, I've got another one. And then, and then, listen, he, he goes beyond that. He doesn't say, I have another and I'll go get him. He gives a disclaimer thinking the prophet's going to go, oh, well, then don't get him. He says, he's out taking care of the sheep. His own father did not think enough of him that when he was commanded by a prophet of the day to bring his sons, his father thought, he doesn't mean that son. He doesn't mean that leftover son. Can you imagine how David felt? By the way, after David was anointed, he was sent back out to watch the sheep. I think dad was just like, yeah, whatever. Okay, get back out there. And so what happens next? So, so what happens to you when you feel like you don't measure up? You'll find yourself comparing and performing. Trying to pretend you're somebody you're not because you're trying to prove that you're great. Because somebody told you one time you don't measure up. You're not as good as your brother. You're not as good as your sister. You're not. Or you're better than them. Or you're better, right? Some people are on the other extreme. You're better than them. So then we think, uh -huh. I work with morons. Number two. You have no purpose. This is the saddest coffee can in the world. Because it's empty. 
although it smells really good. Newt, I am your father. <laughs> Only an 80 person would discover that. So this doesn't really have a purpose right now, except it's prepared to be filled. Some of you are at that point in life where God is preparing you, and you're not there yet. So you feel like, but I'm empty. I don't have a purpose. I haven't figured it out yet. God has a purpose for you, and he's still doing it. And, and so what happens? David's dad, Jesse, says, hey, you know, your brothers are out fighting because they're warriors. And I've got you watching the sheep, but you know what? I need you to bring them sandwiches. I mean, he became Domino's. And so he said, hey, would you take your brother's sandwiches? So that's what he did. And then David gets there and he hears Goliath. You know the story of David and Goliath. And they would, they would sit on this valley and Goliath was over on this hill and yelling at the Israelites. And they were cowering and they were afraid of him. And David said, I'll take him on if none of you. It's probably like this. I'll take him on if none of you guys will. David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard David talking with the soldiers. Anybody have an older brother? Don't look at him. He was angry. This word for anger means kindled anger. It means to breathe through the nose, like disgust. And he said, why did you come here? You know what he was saying to him? Uh, you're here to deliver pizza, dude. What are, you, what are you worried about? You're just you're the delivery boy. You don't really have a purpose. Who do you think you are? The enemy will tell you you have no purpose to try to discourage you, to make you feel weak. Number three, this is my dad's hard hat. Grew up with this. If you had a parent that owned a business, you know this feeling that it's all about work. It's all about getting stuff done. If you get stuff done, you're good. If you don't get stuff done, you're not. So if you're not careful, what begins to happen is you think you're not doing enough. So the brother keeps going. Who's taking care of those, I love this, few sheep? You see what he's doing? Who's carrying those few sheep of yours in the desert? Basically, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. You brought lunch. Get back and get to work. For those of you who struggle with always performing, what the enemy wants you to do is he wants you to get burned out. He wants you to never rest. So the people come to me, and I say, hey, why don't you serve in ministry? They go, oh, I did that once, and I got burned out, so I won't do it anymore. Satan loves that. Satan's not going to attack you if you're not doing anything. He could care less that you're binge-watching Netflix when you could be out serving, caring, calling somebody, texting somebody, emailing somebody, and say, how are you doing? Can I pray for you? Can I encourage you? If you're out feeding the homeless or... But what happens? If we get on the wrong side of that and we think, well, I've got to please everybody, what happens is we get burned out and then we do nothing because we don't take time to rest. So we've got to find that balance. Number four. Worst tape ever. Best tape ever, right? But if you had a tape competition, right? And you had duct tape and this tape, and you sat them next to each other, you'd be like, which one is better? Oh, duct tape all day long, all day long. Duct tape, you can make a boat, a prom dress, wallet, <laughs> small car, right? Come on, how many of you killbillies like duct tape? Come on, let's see it, let's see those hands. I see those hands, you're my people, I see that, I see that. Thank you, thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing this morning about your duct tape experience. But this has a very specific purpose, doesn't it? There's times where this is the best tape because it doesn't rip your wall apart. You would never duct tape a wall to tape it unless duct tape was going to be part of your wall, which would be very redneck. You might be a redneck if <laughs> duct tape is part of your decoration at home. Who do you think you are? That's what the enemy tells you. Neil and I have talked about it. This happens to us on Sundays sometimes. We're showing up for church and the enemy says, who do you think you are? I mean, you got mad on Grissom on the way here. Yeah, but it was there driving. Are you all right? How can you get up and tell people about the Lord? And, and yet, look at the way you acted. Who do you think you are? His brother said, I know that you're proud. That means arrogant. And wicked at heart. Isn't that nice? He went from, you're supposed to be bringing sandwiches to you are evil and proud. And then he says, you came here just to watch the battle. 
He was trying to demoralize him. You ever feel that way? Who do you think you are? And so then David gets brave and he actually goes to Saul and says, hey, I can take on Goliath. And <laughs> here's what's funny. So, so if Saul said, okay, what are your qualifications? He's like, I'm great with a slingshot. Like, can you imagine somebody applying for a job at your workplace and you said, okay, okay, got your resume. And it says here, schooling none. And it says your number one talent is slingshot. What exactly can we do with that? And that's what David says. And so David goes to Saul, who's the king, who's the tall king, who's, by the way, hiding from Goliath. He's shaking. And Saul answers, you cannot go out against the Philistine and fight. Oh. You're only a boy. Goliath has been a warrior since he was a young man. And here's what happened. This is a shelving iron. It's, it's to hang a shelf on this will actually hold a lot of weight. This is actually a really good one. But without being attached, it seems like it's for nothing. I mean, if you didn't know what that was, you'd think, well, what's that piece of metal for? But once you attach it to the wall and put a board on top, this is a really strong, this makes a really strong shelf. But it's easy to look at from a distance and say, you can't do anything. So many of us go through life and when we look at a risk or a challenge or reaching out to somebody or doing something good, we say, you can't. So that we don't try. And then number six. You're just a stick. You don't matter. You ever feel like you don't matter? Maybe you're a teacher and you feel like, oh, I'm not really making a difference. Maybe you work at the Space Center and you have a cubicle with a cat hanging on a stick or something on the wall. Right? Just hang in there. And you think, I don't really matter. I don't make a difference. The enemy wants you to think that what you do doesn't matter. You just whatever. So he comes against Goliath, and as he walks out against this giant Goliath, by the way, Goliath on this stage, his head would hit that curtain. Just so you know. His spear would be taller than that. Which if you were coming against him, that's what you would see. And Goliath says to him, do you think I'm a dog that you come at me with a stick? And by the way, compared to Goliath, David looked like... Goliath had full armor on, and David had clothes Goliath had, a, had two swords, or spears. You know what David had? Slingshot, a couple of rocks. Five, to be exact. He says, do you think I'm a dog? Did you come at me with a stick? And then he used his God's names to curse David. So that means he made up his own cuss words. Dagon. You know, I don't know what his God's he had. And I'm sure David could have easily felt like a stick. You ever feel like a stick? That you don't matter. And yet, God uses sticks to do amazing, cool things. I love rain sticks, really cool. And aggravating if you give it to a four year old. <laughs> you ever have any of those thoughts? You ever have any of those? Does one of those stand out to you as I struggle with that one? Then let's talk today about how to overcome that negative thinking. Number one, ask God to help you with negative thoughts. Have you ever prayed and said, God, you know what? These things roll through my head. I've never really paid attention. But would you help me? So David goes out and Goliath taunts him and cusses at him. And here's what David says. David said to him, I love this. You come to me using a sword and two spears. By the way, I'm sure those spears looked like they were getting ready to come at David, right? I mean, it's, it's like coming up against an army, and you have a slingshot. You come to me with swords and two spears, but I come to you. Listen to this. In the name of the Lord all-powerful, the God of the armies of Israel. <laughs> he says, it may look like I have a slingshot, but God's with me. The next time you feel defeated and discouraged like you don't matter... One of those messages that you're bothering everybody or you're nothing or you're not worthy or you have no purpose happens. Remind yourself, you know what? That may be true, except that God is with me. Sometimes the enemy will remind me, Eric, you're broken. 
Eric, who do you think you are? Look at these other pastors who have voices from the angels. <laughs> and God reminds me, I didn't make you to be them. I made you to be you. What has God called you to be? If he's with you, just be you. And let him use you. You don't have to be that other person. One of my mentors came to church last night. Peter Lord, who I had somebody said, are you going to do his voice in church last night? I said, oh no, I will not in front of him. He doesn't like it. <laughs> ah. But I do it now. <laughs> um. And I realize I don't have to be him. I don't have to be Charles Stanley. It's okay to be Eric. It's okay to be you. Somebody may have told you it's not okay to be you. It's okay to be you. God wants to use you, and he is with you. And when Satan reminds you of your failure, remind him of your victory. Number two, recognize the lies from your past. See, in your life, if you have a theme song that you're in the way, or you're a bother, or you aggravate people, or you've got to work harder, or you never can do enough, or you don't measure up, or you're broken, or you're a failure, or just like David. I mean, look at all the voices that told him, you will never amount to anything, and he became king of Israel. Father of Solomon, through a failure. But he had to realize the lies that he could have believed. Are you believing a lie about yourself that's keeping you from becoming all God has for you? You belong to your father, Jesus said, as the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders, attacked him. He said, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar, the father of lies. So here's what I want you to do. The next time you notice that negative thinking, maybe somebody says something to you and you instantly respond. Pay attention to the stronghold. Pay attention to the tree fort and fire your bottle rocket. <laughs> That's a lie. So I talked to somebody this week, and what happened is they were talking uh, to, to a friend, and their friend looked at him and said, you know, you remind me of this character in this movie. And they said they instantly thought, oh, and they didn't know the character in that movie, they thought, I'm aggravating them. They're, they're probably talking that I'm bothering them. Because when they were a child, they were told, you're bothering people. Quit bothering people. So in their mind, as soon as that person said that, they said, oh, I'm bothering them. So they walked away thinking, I'm bothering them. And later they sent a text and they said, I'm, I'm sorry if I bothered you. Oh, no, I love that character in the movie. Totally responded wrong. Why? Because of the negative thought. Pay attention to why you think what you think. Pay attention and call it a lie and tear it down. When somebody says something, it'll plant in your heart. Satan doesn't have to come back. He's planted it. So pay attention to it and defeat it. So you have to ask God to help. You have to recognize it and then take every thought captive. This is the key verse for today. Put this one on your refrigerator. 2 Corinthians 10.5. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Basically, I'm not better than God. <laughs> You're God and I'm not. And we take captive, listen, every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And a lot of those thoughts have to do with the fact that the enemy will come to you and say you're a failure, you don't matter, your past is all that matters. You have to work harder and stronger. You've got to please God. You've got to earn his love. You've got to measure up. You're better than that person. You're worse than that person. Where do you rank in life? And God reminds us you're who he says you are. So take those thoughts captive. See, the enemy comes to you. God comes to you with conviction. And let me tell you the difference between conviction and condemnation. Conviction says, this is what you did. You need to make it right. So you're on the way to church, and you got in an argument with your spouse. And you're sitting there now, and I just said that, and you went, he knew. He was there. No, I wasn't there. I wasn't there. 
just a lot of you tell me that happens. Anyway, so you get to fight on Sunday morning, I get it. So you're on the way to church, and what happens? You're sitting in church, and the Holy Spirit comes to you and goes, <clears throat> uh, you really need to apologize for what you said this morning? But here's what the enemy would do. You are a failure. You'll never measure up. You always act like an idiot. You can't do anything about those statements. When God speaks to you, it's always very specific. You need to make this area right. You need to deal with that wrong attitude. You need to deal with that sin. It's very specific. The enemy always says you're just a failure. It's hopeless. You don't matter. And it's all these things, just like for David, you can do nothing about. But God is very specific. So pay attention to that and take those thoughts captive. Does what you think agree with God's word? And this is the reason you have to spend time in God's word. Number four, believe what God says about you. Read his words. See what he says about you. If you don't have a quiet time, hey, there's an app you can put on your phone, The Daily Bread. You don't even have to know how to read. You just have to know how to push play. And they have these really cool people that have those cool voices that'll say, Today in Daily Bread. Why you should talk like me. <laughs> right? And then you know, they read the verse. It's really good. It's actually really good. I'm, I'm like, but, you, but you don't have to read. You can push play. If you're not having a quiet time as a couple, push play. Five minutes, just put it on the table and go, we're going to have a quiet time today. <laughs> so spiritual, spiritual. I have an app, there's an app for that. <laughs> Spend time in God's Word, why? Because you're probably believing a lie. There's so many churches today teaching people that you have to earn your way to God. You've got to do something to make God happy. Oh, and if you did that, oh, you've got to do a little more. God's not quite happy. If you don't do this one more thing, well, you're not going to make it. Listen to what Jesus said. Oh, listen to this. Hebrews 4 first. For whatever God says to us is full of living power. Time out. So when God speaks to you, it fills you with power. You take action. When Satan speaks to you, you sit down. I'm a failure. It's sharper than the sharpest dagger. Cutting swift and deep in our inmost thoughts and desires with all their parts, exposing us for what we really are. He knows about everyone, everywhere. And most people see this verse as a negative, but here's the thing. The Bible says the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, but also of righteousness. So not only the mess-ups that we have in life, but also how much God loves us and cares about us. And he's redeemed us and he loves you and you are important and you matter. And he has a purpose for you and you're not a failure and you are worthy, not because of you, but because of what he's done. How do I know that? Listen to what Jesus said if you don't believe me. You ready? Oh, by the way, real quick before I say what Jesus said. Christians all the time, I'll say something to them and they go, well, I'm just a sinner. I don't know why they say it with a country accent. It seems odd. I'm just a sinner. And I say, are you a Christian? I'm a Christian. I'm a sinner. No, you're not. No, no, I am. You should have seen me this morning. I was good at it. You should see. I'm a professional <laughs> sinner. No, no. Nay, nay. If you're a believer, the Bible says you're no longer a sinner, but you've been made righteous. So you can say I'm a sinner saved by grace, but no longer can you say I'm just a sinner. You're not anymore. When Daddy Warbucks adopts Annie, she's no longer poor. And you're no longer a sinner. You're now a saint, the Bible says. That's what's awesome. Nobody even had to approve it. It says in the Bible that together with the saints, we, we've become saints. It's amazing. Does that mean we have it all together? No, 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 no. Nay, nay. <laughs> but it's because of his righteousness. Listen to what Jesus said about you. John 15, 15. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confine his slaves. Listen, Jesus said this. Now you are my friends. Since I've told you everything the Father told me, do you feel like God's your friend? Oh, but Eric, that's just disrespectful. I didn't say it. Talk to Jesus. He's right there. What did he mean by that? He meant that he wants to walk with you and confide in you and help you and walk with life through, with you through life, not sit over you with a judge's thing just whacking you in the head. If you were God's friend, if that seems strange, then you're believing a lie. Finally, number five, learn to walk in grace with yourself and others. See, one of the biggest strongholds in life is religion. Bless you. One of the biggest strongholds in life is religion. And here's the deal. What religion says is you've got to earn your way to God. But when you read the Bible, it says while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
He came to you. The Bible says it's a free gift of salvation. So I went all through uh, elementary, junior high, high school. I was in church three times a week. 17 years of age. I was doing all the church stuff. And somebody came to me and they said, are you a Christian? I said, yeah, of course I'm a Christian. I go to church, do these things. And they said, well, what does it mean to be a Christian? I said, oh. Uh, and I said what I'd always heard a thousand times in church, to make Jesus Savior and Lord. I don't think I said it with that accent. But. <laughs> and they said, really? Well, what does that mean? And I said, um, no. They said, well, that means to make him boss. Is he your boss? Have you ever really surrendered to him? And so I knew about Jesus. I understood Jesus. I read about Jesus. I studied Jesus. I knew verses about Jesus. But I had never said, Jesus, I want to give you my life. I surrender my life to you. I'm sorry for my sins. And I ask you to forgive me. And I surrender to you. That's what it means to be a Christian. It's not about doing a bunch of stuff or trying to earn God's favor. And remember, I talked about performance. So I was trying to make God happy. He said, I call you my friend and you surrender your life to me. Ephesians 2 says it this way, for it's by grace you've been saved through faith. When you trust him, it's not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. If somebody gives you a gift, you don't go, okay, let me pay you back. Somebody gave you a million dollars, you don't go, okay, can I, here's two bucks. What? Not by work, so no one can boast. Why? For we're God's handiwork. You ever think of yourself as God's handiwork? He created you. He made you. He knitted you together. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for you. Now, here's the deal. When you and I understand grace, first of all, we receive God's grace. But you know what else we do? We have grace with other people. The reason that so many Christians leave church and are so grumpy and mean is because they're busy thinking that they're in competition with everybody else. And so they lead and they measure. You say something about their church and they go, well, my church is better than your church. Oh, wait, they do have better whatever. But we got snacks. We got snacks. You should see our snacks. <laughs> well, we have our own building. Oh, well, they got their own building, so, right? But our pastor's crazy. Our pastor's... Okay, he's crazy. Never mind. I was, right? and so what happens? You go through life, and you, instead of having grace with people, you're measuring and you're comparing, so you're hard on them. But when you learn that it's about grace, what happens? You learn that it's okay to fail and to mess up, and then when somebody fails and messes up, you know what you can do with them? You give them the same grace that was given to you. And that's what real Christianity is. It's not about having it together. It's not about getting it all right. It's about surrendering to him and saying, I need grace. If you're here today and your stronghold is pride, you think you don't need God, I want to encourage you today at the end of the service to come and say, Eric, I'm ready to give my life to Christ just like you did in high school. I've played a game or I've not known anything about Jesus, but today I want to surrender to him. If you're here today and one of these thoughts stands out to you and you figured out what your theme song is, ask God to begin to change you and to point that out. So that you can call a lie what a lie is. And that you can receive the truth of how much God loves you, cares about you. We're going to have our offering in just a minute. During that, you just give what God's put on your heart. we got a new song. It's a little bit long. It's a little bit long, but it's great words. And then after that, you can come and say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word and your power. Father, I thank you that when the enemy comes to us and he tries to distract us with either pride or, Father, just feeling horrible about ourselves, Lord, you remind us that it's by your grace. It's by your stripes we're healed, Father. What you've done is what heals us, not what we do. And so, Father, even now we want to surrender to you. Lord, we want to say you're, you're in charge, Father. And, and when we walk away from you and when we do go our own way, Lord, forgive us and take us back. Remind us of what it means to walk in your embrace. Lord, thank for each one here today. I pray if there's one here who doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender to you. Thank you that we can come to the table, that we can sit with you, because you called us your friends. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a great song. It's a great song. It's a little long, but it's a great song. So read the words. You give what God's put on your heart.